Welcome to our reading on understanding the income statement with me, Jonathan Bone. Right, let's have a look straight away at what we've got. Starts off nice and straightforward. Ask us to describe the components of the income statement. So let's start with the income statement in general. What is it? It's a dynamic statement, meaning it spans the period between two balance sheets. And essentially, it's trying to analyze the company's performance. It's looking at the revenues, it's looking at the expenses, it's looking at the gains and losses, and coming, trying to come down to a, a profit figure, either referred to as net profit or net income. Just be aware of some alternative names that your income statement can go by. Statement of operations, statement of earnings, or of course the profit and loss statement, and some people refer to it as the profit and loss account. Underneath that, we've got our income statement equation. Take our revenues, deduct the expenses, and that leaves us with our net income, or net profit, if you like. Now notice under IFRS, you can combine your income statement with your statement of comprehensive income. Now, if you remember, when we talk about comprehensive income, we're saying some items, uh, some gains and losses, if you like, to the shareholders don't pass via the income statement, but instead go directly to stockholders' equity. Well, under IFRS, you can come down to your net income, then you can include the changes in those comprehensive income items, bringing you down to comprehensive income. Under US GAAP, we're requiring two statements. The income statement, get down to net income, finish that statement, and a completely different statement that starts with net income, includes then the other comprehensive income items to take you down to comprehensive income. Now, it says two types here of income statement, a single step and a multi-step. All you really need to know with multi-step is that gross profit is shown on the face of the income. statement. We're going to look at that in just a second. So let's start off by describing some of our elements of the income statement. We talked about revenues, we talked about expenses, we talked about gains and losses. So let's start off with our revenues. So our revenues, you can see amounts reported from the sale of goods and services in the normal course of business. In other words, our sales of our normal trading activity, our day-to-day -day business operations. Now notice, it's not actually the gross sales that are reported in the income statement, it's actually net revenue that's reported, or net sales. Net of what? Well, net of really two things, net of returns. If we sell goods and we allow customers to return the goods, maybe if they're faulty, or maybe we just allow them to return them if they don't want the good, well, we haven't really made a sale. Therefore, we need to deduct those amounts, we need to estimate those amounts and deduct them in recording our sales figure. As well, we have allowances, and these typically are discounts. Maybe I'll sell a good to a customer below its normal market price. So maybe its market price is $10, but I sell at $8. Well, of course, that means I need to record the sale to this customer at $8 rather than $10. So I, if you like, I deduct the $2 discount. So just be aware, we call it net revenue. Sometimes you'll just see it being referred to as the revenue figure or the turnover figure or the sales figure, but strictly it's net revenue. We then turn our atten attention to expenses. Okay, now our expenses, amounts incurred to generate revenue. Two major types here, we're gonna talk about our costs of goods sold. Now these are all of the costs of manufacturing our goods or producing our services. So it's going to include the labor costs, production overheads, materials costs, etc., with producing our finished goods. But we've then got costs that are involved in running the business on a day-to-day -day basis, but are not directly relating to producing goods and services. 
And those are going to be our operating expenses. Again, you may well see the phrase S, G, and A. Typically under US GAAP, you might see that phrase. Sales, general, and administrative, it simply means. But it is all the operating expenses, all the expenses we're incurring in order to run our business, uh, run our primary day-to-day -day business activities, but these costs are not directly related in, in producing your goods and services. We then typically have our interest. Now, of course, our interest expense is not a function of your day-to-day -day business activities. It's a function of your capital structure, how you fund the day-to-day -day activities, the blend, of course, of debt and equity. So we'd like to rather see that separately on the face of the income statement. We're then going to have our tax expense. And often we're going to see this referred to as a provision for tax, meaning an estimate of what we think we owe the tax authorities on this year's profits. So notice what we're doing here. The expenses are grouped together by their nature. The expenses that relate to producing the goods and services within cost of goods sold, the day-to-day -day running of the business within sales, general and admin, the capital structure-based expenses within the interest line, etc. Now we might also see gains and losses in our income statement. Now notice we're saying these typically arise on the disposal of long-lived assets. Now, often we'll use the phrase de-recognition of long-lived assets, meaning essentially, well, we've disposed of them. Now, what they're going to do, essentially, is they're going to look at the proceeds, what you sold these assets for, compare them to the carrying value. Now, the carrying value, of course, just means the balance sheet value at the time of disposal. And if the proceeds are greater than the carrying value, that's going to give us a gain. And if the proceeds are less than the carrying value, well, that will give us a loss. OK, so you might see gains and losses in the income statement. Again, if they're material, i.e. large gains and losses that would affect the opinions of the users of the accounts, then we'll expect to see them separately disclosed. So we might well see gains and losses on the disposal of long-lived assets. We might also see gains and losses on the early retirement of debt that we hold. Again, essentially, if the proceeds that we pay this time rather than receive to extinguish debt are greater than the liability, then we're going to get a loss. If the proceeds we pay to extinguish debt are smaller than the liability, we get a gain. So gains and losses really on long-lived assets and early retirement of debt. OK, let's turn our attention to actually looking at our income statement. So this is a multi-step income statement. I can tell that, notice, because I can see gross profit on the face of my income statement. So the first line I'm seeing there is revenue, of course, or actually, strictly speaking, it's that net revenue. And of course, that's accounted for using the accruals process. In other words, the revenue figure is not the same as cash collected from customers. We're going to record our revenues when they're earned rather than when the customer pays, uh, pays us. Now, directly underneath our revenue is our cost of goods sold. All of the costs in manufacturing our goods and services. And here we're applying the matching concept, trying to match the total cost of goods sold to the number of units that we physically sold. Anything that we haven't sold at year end gets removed from the income statement, transferred into the balance sheet to sit in our current assets within inventory, of course. So revenue, less the cost of producing those goods and service, brings us down to our gross profit, of course. And gross profit margin, if we wanted to see gross profit margin, all it is is gross profit divided by the revenue figure. Now, after that, we're going to deduct our selling general and admin expenses, all of the day-to-day -day costs of running your business that are not directly related to the production of goods and services. So these are going to be things like the accounting function within the firm, uh, legal fees, maybe that kind of stuff. And that brings us down to our operating profit, the profit generated from our day-to-day -day business operations. Now, again, you should be aware there's no strict definition of what should be included in operating profit and what shouldn't. Generally, what, as an analyst, what we're expecting to see is the operating profit reflecting the day-to-day -day core business operations core trading activities of the company. Now notice after that we've got other income and revenue. So this must be other incomes that we've generated that are not really relating to our core business activities. So these might be incidental income, if you like, not, not part of our main trading activities. 
So maybe, you know, we're a trading company and we've received a dividend from uh, a subsidiary or an investment. Well, that's not part of our main activities, so we'll record it as other income. Now, again, when you treat, whether you treat things like dividends received as other income or part of operating income, rather depends on the nature of the company. If you're looking at a company where buying and selling investments is part of its core business operations, then it would be included in operating profit. If it's rather sundry to its main business operations, then we'll treat it as other income and revenue. Maybe we've received some rent. We've rented out part of our property and we're receiving some rent in. Again, if that's not our major business activity, we'll show it as other income. We then bring in our financing costs separately. So this is gonna be predominantly interest, uh, interest expense, interest that we're paying out essentially. And of course we're showing this separately because this is a function of the capital structure of the company, the blend of debt and equity, rather than the day-to-day -day business operations. We then have other items that we want to bring to the attention of our shareholders. Now we've got unusual or infrequent items. Notice the items, uh, unusual or infrequent items here, are above our income tax. You can see we've got income before tax here. Anything before the tax line is going to be shown gross, and the tax relating to those items is going to be included in the tax expense, sometimes referred to as the line. So here we've got unusual or infrequent items. Probably the most important that we're going to encounter in our syllabus is maybe gains and losses on asset disposals if they're material, uh, maybe things like impairments as well we'll expect to see going through unusual or infrequent. Now we then get notice that uh, we come down to our tax line. Notice this is often just simply referred to as the line. Everything above the line reported gross, everything below the line reported net. So our income from discontinued operations are extraordinary items. These are reported net of tax. In other words, we net the tax against the line rather than showing the tax on these two items. The tax on these two items is not included in the provision for income tax. It's netted against the line itself. Anything above the line, then the tax on that element is reported in our provision from income taxes. Notice as well the phrase provision here, meaning it's an estimate. Typically the company isn't going to know what it owes in tax right at the year end. There's a whole process of negotiation with the tax authorities. So it's very much an estimate. And whenever you see that phrase provision, it means an estimated future expense. Now notice after our income from continuing operations, we then get income from discontinued operations. Now this is not the profit or loss when we dispose of subsidiaries or dispose of assets. This is the profit that a division earned. In other words, the operating profits that a division earned up until the point that it was discontinued. In other words, its revenues, its cost of goods sold, its sales general and admin, etc. The gain or loss that we make when we dispose of the shares in a subsidiary or we dispose of assets, well that would be an unusual or infrequent item. So income from discontinued operations, note we're showing it separately here. Why? Because these revenues, these costs are not going to be repeated going forward and therefore we don't want analysts to build it into their expectations of future earnings. So we're rather showing these elements, these earnings separately to say, hey look, they're not going to be repeated, don't build them into your estimates uh, of ongoing future sustainable earnings. Extraordinary items, you see these under US GAAP, you're not going to see them under IFRS. These are items that are both unusual and infrequent and are very strictly defined and we'll talk about those a little later. Finally, we get to the bottom line and a firm's bottom line, of course, is its net income figure. Now remember, under IFRS, you can continue by including the change in the other comprehensive income items and go down all the way to comprehensive income. Under US GAAP, you start with net income and you have a separate comprehensive income statement. Right, we turn our attention now to revenue recognition. We're asked to describe and calculate the general principles, implications, uh, and calculate revenue amounts. So let's start off with International Accounting Standards Board, so the IAS rules. And what you'll tend to find here is that international accounting standards are fairly light in this area. There's not a lot of detail. Whereas US GAAP, far more rules-based, we're going to see a lot of rules covering a lot of detailed transactions. 
And what we're going to see towards the end of this reading is the International Accounting Standards Board and the uh, US GAAP have come together very recently to prevent, provide, a, if you like, a framework for revenue recognition going forward. OK, let's have a look at what we needed in order to record a sale under International Accounting Standards. First of all, risk and reward of ownership is transferred. So the risk and the reward of owning that asset moves from the seller to the buyer. No continuing control or management over the goods sold. So what we're saying, therefore, is the seller cannot have any continuing control. Once the item is sold, it becomes the exclusive property of the purchaser. Reliable revenue measurement. Well, what we're really saying with reliable measure revenue measurement is we can put some kind of monetary uh, value on the sales figure. Probable flow of economic benefits. Well, this is really saying we have to have the expectation that the customer will be able to pay us. Now, especially if we're selling goods on credit, remember we're going to create an asset, trade receivables or accounts receivables at the time of sale. And for it to meet the defin of an definition of an asset, it needs to lead to a future inflow of benefit. So in other words, if we sell a good without the intention that the customer can actually pay, we haven't got an asset, we shouldn't record the sale, we shouldn't record the trade receivable. So certainly we can reliably uh, measure the revenue, it's going to be paid to us so the customer is likely to pay. And then the fifth one, costs can be uh, measured reliably. Now, of course the idea is if you've got reliable revenue and you've got a reliable measurement of cost, then we can work out our profit. Essentially on the transaction, our revenue, less the cost, and we're often going to refer to that as our cost of goods sold, that of course gives us our profit on the transaction. So in other words, they're really simply saying here that in order to be able to record a sale, you should be able to work out the profit element of that transaction. You should be able to match the cost against it. Again, applying our matching concept from accruals, let's match costs against revenues. Okay, recognition for services, slightly different here. Um, now notice, this is really when we're providing a service over a number of periods. Now it says when the outcome can be measured reliably. What does that mean? Well, it means really two things. You've got a contracted selling price, so you know the, pr uh, the revenue that you'll get for providing this service, and you've got a reliable estimate of total cost. Now the argument is, if you know the selling price, and if you have a reliable estimate of total cost of producing this good or service, you know roughly what the profit on producing this service or providing this service will be. Therefore, because we know roughly what the profitability will be, international accounting standards allows us to recognize that profit by reference to the stage of completion. Okay, so here's a, um, a situation there where rather than having to wait until the earnings activities are complete, we're actually being able to bring in profit earlier. So we're going to bring in profit before completion, before we've completed the providing the goods and services, and we're going to bring it in according to what proportion of the goods and service we provided to date. Now, notice uh, the outcome needs to be measured reliably, so the amount of revenue can be measured, and that really is saying, look, you've got a contracted selling price. It's going to lead to a probable flow of benefits. The customer is likely to pay us, in other words. Stage of completion can be measured. We can work out what percentage of the, uh, of the service we've provided so far. And also, costs incurred and remaining costs can be measured. And what that's saying is, look, we know what the overall cost of produ producing this service is. So as we said, if we can tick these boxes, Number one, we've got a good, reliable estimate of the total profitability. And number two, we know what percentage of costs we've incurred so far. In other words, the stage of completion. And therefore, international accounting standards allows us to bring in the revenue on these services according to the stage of completion, rather than waiting until the services have been completely rendered to the client. Now, we turn our attention to US. What we've actually got here is SEC requirements. Uh, so these are, of course, are applying to listed companies in the US. Um, now, let's start actually with the FASB, so uh, US GAAP, the accounting standards. 
Notice it says revenue should be recognized when it is realizable and earned. So first of all, let's take that earned figure. The earned figure is saying, really, typically revenue should be recorded when the sales uh, have been earned, when the activity has been completed. And realizable is really saying, well, we need to have a, a reasonable assurance that the customer will pay us. So let's have a look at the SEC guidance to this. There needs to be evidence of an arrangement between the buyer and seller, some evidence of a contract in place or goods being shipped, that kind of thing. Okay, completion of the earnings process. How do we record the completion of the earnings process? Well, in 99 times out of 100, it's going to be when the firm has delivered the product or provided the service. Okay, so we're saying typically, for in most cases, uh, the earnings process is complete when the goods are shipped to the customer. The price is determined. So in other words, there is a contracted selling price. And there's that key there again. We've got assurance of payment from our customer. Now, again, what that's saying is, look, we overall know whether this product is going to be profitable. So notice, again, very key here to, to note that we record our revenues when the earnings process is complete, not when the customer necessarily pays us. And this is a direct application of the accruals process. We don't account for revenues and costs when cash flows are paid and received. Instead, we're going to account for revenues when the earnings activity is complete. when the goods are shipped to the customer in 99 times out of 100. So sales-based method, this is really what is going to be used for the vast majority of sales for the vast majority of customers. So notice, use when a good or service is provided at the time of sale. Okay, you make the sale, you provide the good right there, you ship the good or you provide the service. Either the sale is up for cash or of course it could be a credit sale. So we make the sale now, but we tell the customer that we, they can pay later, in which case we're going to see an asset being created on our balance sheet, a trade receivable, or otherwise known as an accounts receivable, indicating the customer owes us that money. So notice, therefore, we're going to record the sale at the time of sale when the goods are shipped or provided or when the service is provided. Okay, and again, either a cash sale or a credit sale but of course, remember, we've talked about this idea of reasonable assurance of receipt. So if you are going to sell on credit, notice you have to have a high payment probability. OK, look, let's boil it down to the basics. Typically, we're going to record sales when the goods are shipped. Now, of course, there are some exceptions. We've already talked about one exception with international accounting standards. And there, there was an exception when you were providing services. And it said, look, if you're providing services over a long period of time and you've got a contracted selling price, price a reliable estimate of total cost, i.e. you know the contract's profitability, and you can measure the stage of completion, you are allowed to bring in profit early. Well, US GAAP has a very similar provision. And this is known as our percentage of completion method. OK. So notice it's used for long-term projects. Uh, so very key, long-term projects. Now, this could be uh, providing long-term assets, uh, assets that take a long time to construct, uh, maybe building an ocean liner or a hotel building. But it can also be used for providing services over a long period of time. Now, key phrases that you need to pick up. The must 
be a contract between the buyer and the seller, and that contract needs to contain a price. So we need to have a contracted selling pr price. We need to have a reliable estimate of revenue because of the contracted selling price, cost. Now, if we've got a reliable estimate of revenue and cost, then we know overall profitability, or we've got a reliable estimate of profitability. Now, if you've got a reliable estimate of profitability, then the accounting standards say it is reasonable for us to bring in or recognize that profit as we construct the asset or as we provide the service. Again, notice there is one other criteria that we have. You need to have a reliable estimate of completion time. How long will it take to produce the good or service? So notice, therefore, that both our costs and our revenues and therefore our our profits are going to be recognized in proportion to the percentage of completion. Again, key thing here, unlike the sales basis where we only record the, the sale, the revenue, when the earnings activity is complete, here we're allowed to bring in a revenues, we're allowed to bring in costs, we're allowed to bring in earnings, i.e. profit, before the earnings activity is totally completed. Okay, so let's actually have a look at how we would go about the calculation here. So here is the cumulative revenue, the cumulative sales figure to date. Now notice that phrase cumulative. In other words, this formula is not only going to tell us this year's revenue, but it's going to tell us all of the revenue since inception on the contract. So we calculate the cumulative revenue to date by taking the total costs we've incurred to date over the total project cost. So notice percentage of completion is going to bring in revenue in proportion to the how much of the total cost we've incurred so far. So what we're seeing there is the percentage of cost incurred so far. And we're multiplying that by the sales price. And that gives us the cumulative revenue figure, the cumulative sales figure, this cumulative amount since the contract was actually, uh, or since the contract was set up and started running. Now, trouble with this uh, cumulative revenue figure is some will have been recognized in previous years' income statements. So what we now need to do is deduct the amounts recognized in prior years. So that's what we're doing here. And therefore, that gives us this year's revenue figure. So this is the sales figure relating to this year. Okay, uh, what we then can do is deduct the costs incurred in this period and that will take us down to our profit. And we're certainly gonna see some numbers on that. So let's turn straight to our numbers. Notice our LOS not only asks us to describe the methodology, but it also asks us to calculate here. So Wilden Properties has a contract to build a hotel uh, and Notice it's a contract, first of all. So we have got a contracted selling price. So they're going to contract it to sell it for $2 million. So we've got a contracted selling price. It's going to be received in equal installments over four years. Now, the fact that it's going to be received in equal installments actually has no bearing on how we record the revenue. Remember, revenue and cash collected from customers are two very different things. And we use accruals accounting that records revenues when they're earned, or in this case, records revenues according to the percentage of cost incurred to date, not according to how much our customer has paid us. Now, we've got a reliable estimate of the total cost of this contract. It's going to be 1.6 million. Now, what we're therefore saying is, look, we know roughly the profitability here. $2 million contracted selling price. We think our reliable estimate of cost, 1.6 million. It looks like there's $400,000 of profit on this contract. Now, because we got a reliable estimate of profit, we're allowed to bring that profit in according to the stage of completion. Now, let's have a look at this. We would have incurred costs of 400,000 during the first year, 500,000 during the second year, the estimate of the project's total cost did not change in the second year. So our reliable estimate of total cost has been constant. Calculate the revenue and profit to be recognized in each of the first two years. Okay, well, let's start off with year one. There's our $2 million, uh, our revenue figure. In year one, 
We've incurred, there, there's our cost that incurred. Four hundred thousand out of a total one point six. So essentially, we're saying four sixteenths. In other words, twenty five percent of cost has been incurred to date. So what we're going to do is simply bring in the cumulative revenue of twenty five percent of two million. Now, when we do that, twenty five percent of two million five hundred thousand. Now that is the cumulative revenue figure, but this is year one, so it's actually year one's revenue figure as well. The profit take the 500,000, bring in the cost of 400,000, and we've got profit of 1 million. If you like, remember, our, our, our percentage of cost incurred to date came out at 25%. We said that the contract had a profit of 400,000 in total, 2 million contracted selling price, 1.6 million reliable estimate of total cost. So essentially, notice, we've just brought in 25% of the profit so far. Now let's turn our attention to year two. Now, notice our costs incurred now are 900,000. That's the 400,000 in year one plus the 500,000 in year two. In other words, what we've got on our numerator here is the total cost incurred to date. So 9 sixteenths of the cost now. And that's 56.25%. So we've incurred, let me just slot that in there, 56.25% of the total costs on this project. Now, if we do 56.25 times 2 million, that gives us a revenue figure, a cumulative revenue figure, and I'll just squeeze it in up here. a cumulative revenue figure of 1,125,000 on this project so far. Now that cumulative revenue figure is the total revenue to be recognized to date. In other words, year one and year two's revenue figure, year one and year two sale figure. Now of course, in year one, I've already recorded 500,000. So notice I'm deducting year one's revenue figure and that should leave me with, well, 625,000 that should be year two's revenue figure. Now, a lot of people will say to me uh, in class at this stage, surely there was a quicker way of jumping to this figure. Surely if I'd just done 2 million and multiplied it by this year's cost over the reliable estimate of total costs, I could have jumped immediately down to this figure of 625. Well, let's just check that. 500,000 divided by 1.6 million, 31.25 times 2 million, 625. So indeed it works, but, and here's the caveat, and here's where you need to be careful. I'm totally happy for you to use that in the exam, but it is reliant on one thing, and I'm just going to flip back to the previous slide to point out what that one thing is. So I'm just going to delete this for a second. And there is the phrase. It will only work if your reliable estimate of total cost is consistent between the two years. If the reliable estimate of total cost changes, then the shortcut won't work. So in other words, if reliable estimate of total cost has changed, you're going to need to do the longhand version where you work out the cumulative revenue on the project to date and then deduct revenue, deduct uh, revenue recognized in previous years. So just be a little bit careful on that. Profit in year two, 625 divide, uh, minus the $500,000 costs, so 125,000 in year two. Okay, so that's our percentage of completion uh, for long-term projects. Now, in order to have percentage of completion, remember we had really three elements, contracted selling price, reliable estimate of total cost, and uh, a reliable estimate of the time to complete. So if we don't have those, so in other words, unreliable estimates of revenue or cost, then we're going to have to do something rather different. Now, US GAAP, notice, uses something called the completed contract method. IFRS uses something very similar, but it does have a subtle difference. 
Now, under US GAAP, the completed contract method says, do not report any revenue or any cost in the, in the income statement until that contract, until that project is completed and sold. So no revenue, expense or profit, no revenue, no expense, no profit until the project is completed. Once the project is completed and then sold, then suddenly we know what the revenues were, we know what the profit was, and we can start therefore recording it. Okay, so in other words, during the life, during the construction phase of our project, absolutely nothing is hitting the income statement. Now IFRS, very similar uh, impact on the bottom line, on earnings, but how they get to that is rather different. So notice it's similar, but not the same. We are going to report revenue, so there is sales revenue coming in during the life of the contract, but no profit. In other words, we match the revenue to the cost incurred. If I've incurred $400,000 of cost in year one, I will record $400,000 of revenue in year one, and therefore no profit, no loss. Okay, and therefore IFRS, rather like US GAAP, is only going to recognise the profit once the earnings activity is complete and the project is complete and all costs have been incurred. Let's have a little look then at these two and compare and contrast the US GAAP to the IFRS. So remember, US GAAP using completed contract, so this is our US GAAP. Revenue and expenses are not recognized, okay, meaning they do not hit the income statement. Now, you probably have the question, where do they go? And in many years gone by, we actually did, uh, we did actually have to know the balance sheet treatment of completed contract. These days, we don't. Put it this way, it's stored in the balance sheet within inventory somehow. That's all you need to know. So all these revenues and expenses are being stored in the balance sheet during the construction phase, and then only when the project is complete and the item sold are we going to release them to the income statement. Let's have a look at our example. Uh, we've got building a hotel here for 40 million, cost to build it 32 million. Okay, so we think there's going to be an 8 million profit, but maybe we haven't, um, maybe we haven't got a con contracted selling price, or maybe that 32 million cost is unreliable, or maybe we don't know how long it will take to build the hotel. Now notice in year one, the cost incurred is 6.4 million, but revenue, we show nothing. Expense, in other words, cost, we show nothing. Even though we've incurred 6.4 million, nothing is hitting our income statement. And therefore profit, absolutely nothing as well. Now, of course, on completion, when we finally sell this hotel, we've completed building it and it's sold, then we book the whole revenue figure the whole 40 million hits our income statement. All of the costs are released now from the balance sheet to the income statement. So we've got revenue of 40 million, costs of 32 million, and therefore a profit on this contract of 8 million. Let's have a look at IFRS now. Now, es essentially we said same bottom line impact on earnings. In other words, we're not likely to see uh, any profit being recorded, I say not likely, well we're not, we're not going to see any profit recording until the contract is complete. But how we get to the results is rather different. Okay, so notice we're keeping this the same. We're building a hotel for 40 million, cost to build it is 32 million, cost incurred in year one, 6.4 million. So notice therefore, we are going to put the 6.4 million through our costs in the income statement. But what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that our revenue, our sales figure, is also 6.4 million. So we've got revenue 6.4 million, cost 6.4 million, profit zero. So the end result on earnings is the same as under US GAAP. We don't report any profit. The major difference, though, under IFRS is we do report revenue, we do report costs during the life of the contract, whereas under US GAAP, we see no revenue coming into the income statement we see no cost. Again, on completion in the final year, then essentially the full profit of 8 million will be recorded under IFRS. So same end result on our earnings. So let's describe or let's compare percentage of completion to completed contract. 
Now, net income, of course, is going to be higher, in uh, higher for percentage of completion because we're recognizing our earnings during the construction phase. Completed contract, nothing at all being recorded during the construction phase, and then bang, all of the profit, all of the revenue, all of the cost hit at one point. So net income is going to be higher under percentage of completion during the construction phase. Of course, the only period where that's not going to be true is in the very final period, because under con completed contract, all the profit, all the earnings are recorded in that final period. OK, so net income is going to be higher. Stockholders' equity is going to be higher under percentage of completion until the final year. And of course, in the final year, all the profit hits under completed contract, meaning equity will be the same under both methods. Now, income volatility, what we're essentially doing with the percentage of completion methods is we're smoothing, we're spreading the revenue, the cost, the earnings over the life of the contract, dampening the volatility. Whereas completed contract, we've got a much more volatile income statement. Nothing year one, nothing year two. Let's say we complete the contract in year three, bang, loads of revenue, loads of costs, loads of earnings. Then we move on to our next contract, nothing in the next year, nothing in the next year, bang, a load of profit. So you're going to get a very volatile uh, set of earnings if you're using completed contract. And of course, volatility in earnings is the same thing as saying really risk of earnings. Remember, volatility, risk. OK, cash flows, uh, how are they affected? Well, notice they're the same for both methods. The cash is when we physically incur costs and pay out cash to our suppliers. And of course, it's when the customer uh, pays us, which of course is very different from the reporting of revenue. And notice it's the same for both methods. So the recognition method is reflecting the reporting of earnings under the accruals method, not the timing of cash flows. So let's turn our attention to the next type of sale, and this is installment sales. So this is the scenario where you've allowed a customer to pay you on installments. Now, if, and let's start off here. So look, a firm finances a sale and payments are expected to be received over an extended period. That's the key phrase that we're picking up on this top line. In other words, we've sold a good or service and we've said to the customer, hey, pay us on instalment rather than paying us one amount up front. Now notice, if we are certain of collectability, so if collectability is certain, then revenue is recognized at the time of sale. In other words, we not use the normal sales basis. As soon as the earnings activity is complete, the goods are shipped, or the service is provided, then we record the sale, not when the customer pays us. So as long as collectability is certain, it makes no difference that we've allowed the customer to pay on instalment. OK, so our situation must be when we do have uncertainty whether the customer will pay us. So that is going to be the key thing. If collectability is uncertain, OK. Now notice actually the revenue uh, that we would record at the time of the sale, if collectability is certain, would be the present value of any payments and interest to be received over time. Right, okay, let's turn on our attention to the important bit. If collectability is uncertain. So there are two methods we're going to look at here, instalment sale and cost recovery. Both of them have collectability from the customer as being uncertain. So we're unsure whether the customer will pay us. However, if we're going to use instalment sales method, the cost is known. Whereas if we're going to be using the uh, cost recovery method, the cost is not known. What do we mean by the cost here? The cost of providing the goods or services. So if you know the cost of providing the good or service, but are just uncertain whether the customer will meet their instalments, then you're going to use the instalment sales method. If you are uncertain about the cost of providing the total good or service and you have a worry that the customer won't pay, then we're going to use the cost recovery method. OK, let's get straight into an example of this. So during 20X0, Cook Incorporated sold $20,000 of inventory on instalment and it had cost $10,000. So we've got a reliable estimate of cost here of $10,000. During 20X0 and 20X1, Cook collected 8,000 and 12,000 of its receivables. Under the instalment method, 
So what we're saying is, look, we've got this 20,000 uh, that we've sold, and we've allowed the customer to pay 8,000, uh, essentially, and 12,000 in two different years. So we've allowed the customer to pay us on instalment, but remember, if we're using the instalment, then we are unsure of payment. We don't know whether the customer will make these payments when they fall due. So what are the sales and gross profit to be reported in each of the two years? Now, of course, normally, if we thought the customer was going to pay and we had reasonable assurance, then, of course, at the time of the sale, when the goods are sold, we would have recorded a sale of 20,000, cost of goods sold 10,000, and, of course, therefore, uh, a gross profit of 10,000. But because we're unsure of payment, that's not what's going to happen. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to bring in the revenue, the sales figure, as we receive the cash from the customer. So we're expecting 8,000 in this year, X0, and 12,000 in X1. Costs are good sold. Well, we know the item costs us 10,000 to produce. And what we're going to do is simply bring that in in proportion to the revenue we've collected to, to date. So notice what we're saying is in X0, we've collected 8,000 out of a total 20,000. So 8 twentieths, which of course is going to be 40 40%. Uh, so we're going to bring in 40% of the cost of providing the good or service. We know it costs 10,000, 40% of 10,000, that gives us our 4,000. In X1, we've received 12,000 out of a total of 20,000, so that's going to be 60%, so we'll bring in 60% of the cost. Okay, so notice therefore our gross profit is going to be 4,000 and 6,000. Remember, compare that to the sales basis, assuming the goods were sold in 20X0, under the sales basis, we would have had the full revenue in this year, the full cost in this year, and therefore the full earnings in this year. Okay, so notice what this installment method is doing. All it's doing is not affecting the total profit or the total revenue, it's affecting the timing of it. Because we have uncertainty of assurance, we're not bringing in revenue and profit until the customer has actually paid that installment. Now, let's turn our attention to the cost recovery uh, method. So during 20X0, we've sold $20,000 of services this time, but the cost of providing the service was unclear at the outset of the contract. Significant. We don't know what the total cost of providing the good or service was. During X0 and X1, Cook collected 8,000 and 12,000 respectively of its receivables. Project was completed in X1, at which time the company had incurred total cost of 10,000. Under the cost recovery method, what's our sales and gross profit? Okay, now, we bring in the sales figure just like the installment method. In other words, we bring in the sales as we receive the cash from the customer. So that's 8,000 in, in X0, and it's going to be 12,000 in X1. But the difference is we're not going to record any profit until we've fully recovered all of our costs. Now, our full cost is 10,000 here. In X0, we've only recovered 8,000. So we haven't yet recovered the full cost. So we're going to plug in a cost of goods sold figure equal to the sales figure, so 8,000, to bring us down to zero. So we're not allowed to recognize profit until the costs have been fully recovered. Hence that name, the cost recovery method. Now, in X1, we record 12,000. We've only got a further 2,000 of cost to recover, so we recover that 2,000 of cost, and there we go, the 10,000 being reported in X1. Again, so notice the sales basis method, the installment method, the cost recovery method. All we're really affecting here is the timing of the revenues and the timing of the profits. In uh, under the sales basis method, the profit is all recorded at the time of sale. Under installment, we record the revenues as we collect the cash from the customer, and we show the profit in proportion to the cash we've collected so far. And then finally, under cost recovery method, revenues reported as we collect the cash from the customer, but we don't show any profit until we've fully recovered all of our cost. Okay, so if the outcome of a project cannot be estimate, estimated, 
Reliability revenue recognition under IFRS is very similar to the cost recovery method. So just be aware, uh, again, uh, similar to cost recovery for IFRS. Barter transactions, right, this is essentially where we're exchanging a good and service and rather than receiving monetary benefits, we're receiving a service back or a good back uh, from our customer. So it's an exchange of goods and services between the two parties rather than somebody supplying a good or service and receiving cash. Now both IFRS and US GAAP are broadly similar on what they say. They say, well look, you are gonna need to show revenue as if you'd sold a good for cash, but what should the cash figure, what should the revenue be fi figure be recorded at? IFRS si simply says the fair value of similar non-barter transactions. So in other words, if you've sold similar items for cash, record the barter transaction at the cash flow you'd received in non-barter transactions. Notice unrelated parties, it says. So in other words, these, the, the non-barter transactions have to be on proper commercial terms. They can't be with insiders of the company because, of course, there's always the danger that those are not proper commercial terms. So in other words, it has to be genuine third parties. So IFRS, if you've got a barter transaction, record the, the sale at the, the revenue that you received for similar cash sales. That's all it's really saying. Now, US GAAP is broadly in line with that. So again, use the fair value only if the company has received cash payments for such services historically. In other words, it's saying nine times out of 10, let's go with the same as IFRS. Let's look at the cash value uh, of similar services. Now, it then says, if you haven't sold these goods for cash in the past, then instead, you're gonna have to record the revenue at the carrying value of the asset. Now, what's the uh, carrying value of the asset? The balance sheet value of the asset. Now, if you record the sale at the carrying value of the asset, and you record the cost of goods sold at the carrying value of the asset, it's gonna result in no profit being recorded on a barter transaction. Gross versus net reporting, again, I just think you need a, a very brief awareness of this. It's really an issue uh, with the growth of internet-based merchandising companies. So these are the companies where you can actually place an order, and rather than fulfilling the order themselves, what they might do is pass the order to a third-party supplier. Now the question is, are they are acting as an agent in this situation, or are they the primary obligator? So look, we're interested in the companies that sell the product but never hold the inventory. Essentially, all they're doing is passing an agreement to, a, uh, to one of their suppliers and saying, hey, fulfill this customer's order. So the third party supplier will ship to the end customer. Now this leads us with two ways of tra uh, treating this. One, we could report gross. Imagine the customer has bought goods for $100. It's cost $80 to supply those goods. So we would show the revenue $100, the cost of goods sold, $80, gross profit, 20. Now, if we believe they are essentially acting purely as an agent, we shouldn't show the revenue separately. We shouldn't show the cost of satisfying uh, uh, or delivering the product separately. Instead, we should show a net sale. In other words, what we're really saying is, look, this is like brokerage. This is like an agent, uh, an agent's fee here. So the question is, when to report gross, when to report net. Well, we've got some rules here. US GAAP tells us, look, we will report gross if we are the primary obligator. In other words, if we have the ultimate responsibility to supply the customer with that good, if the customer has contracted with us, if we have the inventory risk, i.e. the risk of obsolescence, if the inventory is to become obsolete, do we make the loss or is it a third party that makes the loss? If we have the credit risk, i.e. if we have the risk that the supplier, uh, that we will, will make a loss if the, if the customer doesn't pay us, then essentially, again, we're gonna report gross. If the internet merchandising company has a choice of different suppliers, they can choose which supplier they, they use to ship the goods to the end party, again, gross. And then finally, if it's the merchandising company rather than the third party that ships the goods, that sets the price. Look, all what these points are really saying is, if you have the risk and the reward of the sale, then you should report gross. 
Now, if these criteria are not met, then essentially we're simply acting as an agent and therefore we just need to report the net amount rather like a brokerage fee. Good, implications for analysis. Um, well, implications for analysis is revenue can be quite a complicated uh, uh, topic and it can be quite a complicated uh, number in the financial statements. So certainly we need to know what recognition policies the company has used. And remember, all of the key accounting principles will be set out in the footnotes. So very important we look at those footnotes, how are they recording their revenues? Anything that re results in revenues being recorded early, we typically refer to as aggressive. So percentage of completion, for example, would be an aggressive method compared to uh, completed contract, which is more conservative. So anything that accelerates revenue recognition, aggressive. Anything that delays revenue recognition is going to be considered conservative. Consider any estimates that are being used in the methods. Wherever we see estimates in financial statements, we're talking about subjectivity. Now again, percentage of completion, a, a classic one where there are estimates. We're looking at um, reliable estimate of total costs. We're, uh, we're looking at cost to date to work out the percentage of completion. Then, of course, if you're comparing two companies, then you need to look at how their accounting principles have affected the data in the financial state statements and therefore affected the ratios that you've calculated. In particular, if you've got one company using percentage of completion, another company using completed contract, then you know their financial statements are not directly comparable and you know there will be distortion in ratios. So maybe you need to uh, recalculate the income statement of one company to move it in line with the other. Okay, so we've now come across a relatively new uh, piece of um, accounting standards. And it's a convergence program that both US GAAP and IFRS have been working on. We're asked to describe the key aspects of the converged accounting standards. Now, essentially, IFRS has had very little rules in this area, so very limited guidance under IFRS under revenue recognition. US GAAP has had very detailed rules based. And what they wanted to do here is come up with a framework, a principles based approach that could be applied to all different situations in order to come up with the correct treatment for revenue recognition. Now it doesn't mean that we're gonna lose percentage of completion, completed contract, installment sales, etc. All it means now is we have a unified framework in which all transactions will essentially fit. Now notice as well, this guidance actually came out in 2014. It's due to kick in under US GAAP, December 2016. And notice companies are not allowed to uh, adopt it earlier. Under IFRS, it's gonna come in later, not much later, admittedly, uh, so January 2017, but you can adopt early if you want. Okay. So we're going to need to have a quick look at this and a detailed look. Okay, so what they've moved to is a five-step model that can be applied to all transactions. So it's a five-step model, and I would suggest that we're going to need to remember these five steps. Now, the first point that we have here is we need to identify contracts with our customer. So what we're looking at is an agreement and commitments that establish uh, contractual obligations, and contractual rights. Now, another key point here is a contract contract exists only if collection is probable. So again, you don't have a contract unless collection is probable. IFRS and US GAAP have slightly different definitions of the word probable here. IFRS says more likely than not, whilst US GAAP says likely to occur. Now that of course is slightly different which might mean that IFRS says there's a contract when US GAAP doesn't, or vice versa. So first of all, we've got to identify a contract between the two parties in terms of obligations and rights. The second point, once we've established the contract, is we move down to look at the performance obligations. These are promises of, to transfer distinct services or goods. Let's make a note of that. So we're going to transfer distinct services or goods. Okay, 
So it needs to be established as a performance obligation. What does uh, distinct mean? It means the customer will benefit from it. Now the key point here is each performance obligation is going to be accounted for separately. Okay, so we're going to account for each separately. Okay, so essentially what we're doing is we're taking a contract and we're dividing it up into each of the performance obligations. Each one is going to be used to recognize a sale. Now, what we then do is we take the transaction price. And that transaction price, first of all, we've got to determine the transaction price. Now, this is simply the price that the seller estimates will be received from the customer when they transfer goods and services. So in other words, the monetary amount received on transfer, the transfer of these goods and services. Okay, now the then step four, once we've got a total transaction price, we have to allocate the transaction price to the various performance obligations. Okay, so we're gonna allocate, and there it is, that's that next point, and this is really the key step. Take that transfer uh, transaction price and allocate to the various performance obligations that you observed in the first step, essentially. Now, revenue is gonna be recognized. In other words, we're gonna record the sale when a performance obligation has been satisfied. Now, again, the accounting standard here talks about um, revenue being recognized when an obligation satisfying transfer is made. In other words, when a good is shipped to the customer or a service is completed for the customer, then we're gonna record the actual revenue. Now again, the international accounting standards actually give you some examples of this. Let's take the example where um, a producer has been uh, contracted to construct a building. So the buyer uh, essentially is, is, is buying a building. Now, there are various goods and services that are gonna be provided when you construct a building. The engineering, the construction, the wiring, the plumbing, the brickwork. Are these separate performance obligations? In other words, could each point, could each, uh, each, each part of this, the engineering, the construction, the, the wiring, the plumbing, could each be seen as being a separate sale? Well, the answer is it depends really on the contract. If the customer's contract to buy a whole building, then of course, then essentially the earnings activity is not complete until the whole building can be provided. So in other words, the answer would be, no, they're not separate performance obligations. The only way they would be is if they're written into the contract that the customer will essentially pay for these as they're provided. So typically, no, the customer will have contracted for the building, not the separate goods and services. So you do need to be a little careful on this. Notice as well, new disclosure requirements are kicking in with this new uh, accounting standard that's uh, coming into play. What have we got going on here? Now notice contracts with customers are gonna have to be disaggregated into categories. So we're gonna have to talk about the type of contract. Okay, so we're gonna have to look at the different types, essentially of customers and sales contract. We're also gonna look, need to look at geographical regions. So we're gonna have to divide it up our sales by location going forward. Also, another thing that they need to look at is contract duration, which of course is gonna be significant for long-term contracts. Also, okay, so a lot more detail on the various types of sales, looking at the various categories, contract, uh, looking at sales by the type of sales, are we selling immediately when goods are shipped? Is it a long-term contract, etc.? The duration of contracts, how long it's taking to fulfill the customer, uh, the, the uh, contract obligations, and also sales by region are gonna need to be shown. Also, contract-related assets and liabilities. So more information on the balance sheet, of course. Now, as it happens, when we looked at percentage of completion, completed contract, we only really focus on the income statement in our CFA syllabus. But of course, there are implications on the balance sheet. And what they're gonna have to show is the balances now 
uh, and also the changes in balances over the course of the year that relate to sales related transactions. Obviously, we've got our accounts receivables, but as I said, long term contracts and completed contract have other implications in your balance sheet that we're not expected to know for the CFA syllabus. Notice as well, we're going to have to disclose remaining performance obligations. So certainly when we've got a contract and we're able to take that transfer uh, transaction price and split it into lots of different performance obligations, we would need to be indicating the performance obligations that have been satisfied and here clearly the performance obligations that still need to be satisfied. Also notice, we're going to take the transaction price, we're going to take the total contract price, and we're going to allocate it to all of the performance ob obligations, and that disclosure is going to be made in the accounts as well. Notice any significant judgments and changes in judgments that we use for our revenue recognition. So again, think of your uh, percentage of completion, where our significant judgments are the reliable estimate of cost and the total cost incurred today. Well, if those judgments change, again, we're expecting them to be disclosed. Expense recognition, let's get towards the end of this, uh, this, this uh, little recording. Expense uh, recognition, accruals basis, the matching principle. It says match costs against associated revenues. In other words, if you've got a cost that directly relates to a revenue, then bring in the cost in the income statement in the same period as the revenue. Great example of this, of course, is depreciation amortization. You've bought a machine, it's going to generate revenue over a number of years. We capitalize the cost, which simply means store it in the balance sheet. We're then going to release that cost to meet against the, to match against the higher future revenues in the income statement. Now, of course, the mechanism to take the cost out of the balance sheet and through the income statement is depreciation, of course, for our property, plant and equipment. It's amortization for our intangibles. So typically, we try and match costs against revenues. Now, of course, certain of our costs are not linked to revenues at all. So maybe uh, you've got your head office. Now, it's not linked to producing sales. It's where all the admin functions exist for your company. So it's not, you can't match it against sales. So what about the rent for your head office? Well, if it doesn't directly relate uh, to revenues, then we tend to refer to them as period expenses. In other words, we allocate the, the cost against the period of use rather than match against revenues. So these are typically our admin costs. So what we're simply saying here is if you've occupied your building for one year, we want to see one year's worth of rent going through your income statement, regardless of whether you've received an invoice from the landlord or not. So, a load of implications. We're going to see lots of assumptions and judgments. Inventory valuation. Year end, we know that we haven't necessarily sold all of the items we've purchased. So, of course, what we do is we remove the items that we haven't sold from the income statement and transfer them into the balance sheet. Issues. Number one, we've got to count the items that we haven't sold. Number two, we've got to establish the cost of the items that we haven't sold. And there's a number of different methods we can use. FIFO, LIFO, AVCO, and specific ID, all of which we'll be looking at later. Warranty expenses. Here, what you're doing is agreeing to repair faulty goods if they, go, if they break, if you like, within a fixed length of time from sale. Now, again, if you're applying the matching concept, we need to match the cost of repairing faulty goods to the revenue that was generated. In other words, we need to record the warranty expense at the time of sale. Problem is, you don't know what goods are going to become faulty and need replacement at that point in time. So therefore, the warranty expense is a provision. It's an estimate. It's what we think we will incur based on our prior experiences. Depreciation, amortization, again, um, the methods that we use to calculate depreciation and amortization, very subjective. Number one, we've got different um, depreciation methods, straight line versus accelerated. And number two, we've got subjective inputs, such as uh, the salvage value, the residual value of the asset at the end of its life and its useful life. Doubtful debt provisions. We record the accounts receivable, trade receivables in our balance sheet, uh, a net of the doubtful debt provision. In other words, you've made sales on credit. We know that some of our customers will default, 
and therefore we need to deduct the amount of defaults uh, that we, we're expecting from the accounts receivable figure in our balance sheet. Why? It's because the asset must lead to a probable flow of benefit. In other words, if a customer isn't going to pay us or is unlikely to pay us, it's not an asset. So we net the doubtful debt provision against amounts owed by our customers at year end. And of course, our revenue recognition methods. We've seen with a lot of those as estimates and assumptions. First of all, we've got to uh, spot when the earnings activity is complete. Then we need assurance of receipt from our customer. And that's just with a normal sale. If we look at complete uh, long-term contract, then we've got things like reliable estimate of total cost, percentage of cost incurred to date, etc. So revenue recognition, very important. Analysts must review the accounting principles being adopted by the company in the footnotes and must be reviewing them from year on year consistency. Are they accounting for revenue consistently year on year? Of course, if there's any changes to revenue recognition policies, we would expect to see them being discussed in the management discussion and analysis. Now we then just quickly look at a, a couple of items here, describe uh, inventory, the matching principle, depreciation methods as well, and a little bit of amortization. We're going to blast through quickly because we're going to see this covered in lots more detail in later readings. Now, of course, costs of goods sold should be matched with items sold and recorded as revenue over the period. In other words, let's imagine that I've sold, let's say, 10 units. But let's look at cost of goods sold for a trading company. It's made up of my beginning inventory, my purchases, less my ending inventory. OK, let's say I've got two units of beginning inventory, 12 units of purchases. Now, at this stage, I've got 14 units in my income statement, but I only sold 10. So what we're doing with our ending inventory is we're saying, well, hang on a second, four units have yet to be so so sold. I'm going to deduct those from my, from my uh, income statement and transfer them to the balance sheet. And of course, what that now means is our cost of goods sold also reflects 10 units. So the total cost reflects the total number of units sold. Ending inventory is removing items that haven't been sold and transferring them to the balance sheet. Now, of course, the next question is, how do I value those four items of ending inventory? Well, I'm going to use cost flow methods. And there's a number of different cost flow methods I can use. For high value items, I'm going to use specific ID. I.e., I'm going to match the actual purchase cost with the item of ending inventory. Might do that for things like diamonds, for example. If I've got low value items, then I might make some assumptions. Very typically, first in, first out. This assumes that the first items that I purchased were the first items sold, and therefore my ending inventory is made up of the most recent purchase prices. So I value my ending inventory at the most recent purchase prices. You might make a decision that you have no idea whether you've sold old or new items, they all look the same, so you might use the average purchase price during the year. Depreciation method. Now remember what we said, we're going to store a cost of our infrastructure in the balance sheet. That infrastructure is going to help us generate revenues over a number of periods, generate earnings over a number of periods. So we're going to release the cost to match against the earnings over the asset's life. So here we are, we've got a, uh, a cost here for a truck of 20,000. It's going to run for 100,000 miles. And we're going to depreciate it at uh, 20 cents per mile used. Okay, in other words, the $20,000 divided by the 100,000 miles. So we're going to spread the cost of the truck into the income statement according to how many miles it's been driven this year. Same with an oil tanker. Notice it will last for 25 years and then be sold for scrap. We're going to use straight line depreciation. So what we do is we'd look at the cost of the tanker minus the scrap proceeds that we believe that we will receive at the end of its life over its UEL, I'm going to call it, its useful economic life, in this case, the 25 years. Now, number one, we've chosen straight line depreciation rather than accelerated. Number two, there's two elements of subjectivity here. In other words, how do I know what I can scrap the asset for? I'm only really going to find that out at the end of its life. And how do I know that I'm going to use it for 25 years? 
So again, subjectivity going on in this. Notice I've got some DVDs purchased for rental here. Now, again, maybe straight line depreciation over 25 years wouldn't be applicable. So notice what we've decided to do here is use an accelerated depreciation method. Now, all you need to know with accelerated depreciation at this stage is it will charge more depreciation in the earlier years of the asset's life and less depreciation as the asset ages. Now, under IFRS particularly, you have to choose a depreciation method that matches the earnings potential of the asset. So if you've got an asset that's going to generate higher revenues in its early years and then revenues are going to decline as the asset ages, you must use an accelerated method. The one that we're going to see later on is double decline in balance. And then finally, a little bit on amortization. Amortization is really simply depreciation of intangible assets, uh, such as patents, royalty agreements, etc. Our intangible assets infrastructure with no physical form, um, and we're going to spread the cost over their life, just like we do with property, plant, and equipment. Now, notice if the earnings pattern cannot be established, then we're going to use straight line, essentially. In other words, cost minus any salvage value, resell value over the life of the asset. OK, so for both IFRS and US GAAP, they're going to typically amortize straight line. What is the salvage value of an intangible asset? Can it be sold on? Well, typically, uh, the answer is no. Typically, we're going to give it a value of zero. So it's unusual to see salvage. So the major area of assumption, therefore, is the life. And the idea that if we're using straight line, we're assuming that the earnings pattern is even over the life of the asset. Now, we have to amortize our finite life intangibles. But we, if we have infinite life intangibles, we do not have to amortize. And our infinite life intangible is potentially goodwill arising on an acquisition. Now, if you have infinite life intangibles, you don't amortize, but they must be checked annually for impairment. And impairment is essentially when the fair value of the asset has fallen below the balance sheet value. 